Hey everyone, I haven't managed to post as many videos as I'd have liked lately because I've been pretty busy, but mainly because I've been working on an audiobook, and it's just been released to Audible and iTunes. From the best-selling author of Demonic and Other Tales comes The Darkest Hours, an epic tale of good versus evil spanning time and dimension. From modern-day gothic to ancient fantasy realms, the Darkest Hours is a genre-bending, action-packed, sci-fi horror classic in the making, with badass heroes and terrifyingly evil villains. Tempers flare, guns roar, and swords clash as loyalty and love are tested, but no one is safe from the oncoming darkness. While this channel always deals with allegedly true accounts, I'm sure if you like it here, then you'll love the adventures in the book. Go check it out. Links in the description. And with that, let's get on with the video. I had just transferred schools, and I took a new position as a high school librarian. There was a little snack bar run by the cafeteria workers in the student centre. Bill was the guy who managed the register for the snack bar. He was a short man in his late fifties. He always had a smile for anyone who came to visit. He really loved it when the adults of the building came by to get food and drinks, and he would try to start a conversation with anyone who would stop and talk. He seemed sad and lonely. Over the first few months of stopping by there for my morning tea, he would always ask me questions. I was in a serious relationship at this time. I had been with my partner for six years and we had a child together. He seemed genuinely interested in getting to know me. I never got any weird vibes from him. He seemed like a sweet father or grandfather type figure. Over the summer, between my first year of working and my second year, my boyfriend and I broke up. I didn't talk about it at work when I could help it. It was painful to talk about because we had been together for so long and had a child. I was trying to date online. I was on the main ones, Facebook dating, Tinder, plenty of fish and Bumble. I live in a pretty small town, so the same men were on all of the same apps. I went on a few dates, but overall, the entire process was a disaster. I only stayed on the apps for the first full semester of my second year and then deleted all of them to remain single. During this time, Bill's attention started to change. He would get very excited when I came down to get my morning drink. He knew about my breakup and would ask me how dating was going. I did not remember telling him that I was single, but I assumed I must have let it slip at some point in our conversation. I would come back in the mornings and tell him all about my terrible dates. I remember telling him that I was giving up on dating. He tried to hold my hand to try to comfort me. I immediately jerked my hand back. I told him I was fine with my life and that I won't date again until I'm happy with just myself. Each morning that I went back, I noticed that he kept trying to find excuses to touch me. I had hair on my clothes, or he needed to fix the alignment of my jacket. I started to get very creeped out from his attention. I stopped going down to get a drink. I told him I didn't have time in the morning anymore, because the library was getting more kids needing me to check out books before school started. Since I wasn't coming down to see him, he started coming down to see me. He started by just bringing me tea. If I was not at my desk, he would leave it for me to find. At first, I didn't mind it too much. Things just appeared, and I didn't have to fake smile when he came by. After a few weeks, it stopped being just tea. He started bringing me food too. We just got a shipment of oranges in, he said. I picked out the very best ones for you. I know how much you love oranges. The gifts became bigger and bigger until he was bringing me full meals from the cafeteria. I started trying to think how I could get this to stop while also being polite. 
I had to be nice, right? Over time, I couldn't eat the food. I would give it away or trash it the moment he left the room. The next time he came down with his arms filled with free food for me, I told him that I didn't want him to bring me anything because I was on a diet and I was bringing my own food to school. You're perfect just the way you are, he said with a smile. I replied a thank you. Why do I feel the need to be so nice to creepy people? When he would try to bring me food down, I would thank him and remind him that I did not want any more food. When he would come in and I wasn't at my desk, I would duck down and hide until he left. The student started to ask what was going on. I'm a grown woman, the person in charge of these students, and I'm hiding on the floor behind a stack of books to avoid talking to him. The students even said that they did not like him. The students had nicknamed him the Troll. It was such a fitting name. Over time, he understood that I didn't want any more food from him. I had a month of glorious silence. No visits, just awkward waves in the hallway if I passed by, and my second year as a librarian ended. When the third year started back up, I had a lovely summer without a thought of him. I walked into the library on the first day with a present on my desk. I opened the package. It's a coffee tumbler and a gift card to Starbucks. No name or card to say who gave it to me. I wasn't sure it was him, so I went down to ask. He said that he wanted to buy me something special and to have my school year start off with a smile. I accepted the gift and thanked him. I'm not saying no to some free drinks. I shouldn't have taken it. I know that now. The gifts didn't stop. At least once a week, he would bring me something. Each gift got more expensive and I became increasingly more uncomfortable. By October, I told him to stop. Do not bring me anything. Do not buy me anything. It makes me uncomfortable and I will not be buying him anything in return. He didn't listen. He kept bringing me things. I knew he couldn't afford this on his cafeteria worker's salary and I told him that. Just stop. I started to get angry with him. I was no longer smiling or saying thank you, but I realized my biggest mistake now. I took the gifts. I took them because I don't have a lot of money and the gifts were truly all the things I loved. I should have never accepted them. I started to confide in other co-workers about how uncomfortable the whole situation made me. Most of them would reply, He is single and really nice. He obviously likes you. I know he's older, but maybe you should give him a chance. I did not. With each unwanted gift, he would say, I know you told me no gifts, but I just had to get this for you. On Valentine's Day of my third year, working at this school, a giant gift basket was on my desk. I brought the entire thing back to him. I told him to take it back, that this was just too much. I guessed that it was about $150 for the entire thing. I told him to keep it. He said that if I took this, it would be the last gift he promised. I took it and made him repeat it again that this was the last gift. I did not get the chance to test this. By the next month, the entire country shut down for COVID. I had to still be on campus to work despite all the students being remote. In April, he came to my desk with a goodbye gift. He was quitting the job because they couldn't pay any of the cafeteria workers without students on campus. He was moving away. I cried with him, partly because I'm empathetic when others cry, and mostly from my relief. He was leaving. I never had to speak to him again. The next day, I had a friend request and a message from him on Facebook. I didn't respond or accept the request, but it did fill in some gaps in my knowledge. He had a car as his profile picture, and I remember the picture from all my dating apps. That's why his demeanor changed. He saw me on all of the dating apps, and I had ignored him. For eight months, I thought it was over. 
I didn't think about him. School started back up this past August, with students back on campus. It was a relief not to worry about seeing him or finding random things on my desk. In October, my work phone started ringing. I was busy, so I didn't answer. After the person called about five times, I finally answered, thinking it was a very urgent parent. It was creepy troll Bill. He had to talk to me. He was in love with me. He spent every day thinking about me. And, oh, by the way, he is married with grandchildren. Guess who is ready to leave his wife for me? Crazy troll Bill. He kept me on my work phone for 45 minutes. I listened. I was nice. In hindsight, I have no idea why I kept talking to him. I told him that I was not interested in him in that way. He begged to be friends. I said fine. He asked me to accept his friend request, and I did. He tried messaging me the next day, but I left it on read. Two weeks later, I get a message from the front office that a representative from a company needs to talk to me. I rarely get sales reps coming in person, especially after COVID. I go to the front, and it's the troll in a suit, large bags under his arms. The secretary thought he must have been a regular, because she recognized him, but couldn't place from where. He asked to come in and talk to me, but with COVID safety rules, no one is allowed in the school. I go outside in the cold to talk to him. He explains that he just wanted to drop off a few gifts for me. He proceeds to take each of them out of a bag. He tells me where he was, how it reminded him of me, and why I have to have it. He bought things for my kid, nowhere close to what he needs for his age. I'm panicking. My stomach hurts. I feel like I'm trapped, but outwardly, I'm polite and nice. He asks to hold my hand while he reads the poetry he wrote for me, but I refuse and move as far away as I can manage. The poem he reads references a picture of me. He has the picture printed out. He said it's his favorite of mine. I'm 14 years old in the picture. How far back did he go on my Facebook? And this man used to work in a high school. I tell him again that I don't have any interest in him. He says, that's okay. I just need to be near you. I will take any attention that you're willing to give me. I just need to be in your life. He goes in for a hug. I try to get away, but I am trapped between a tree and a bench. With his height, his face is buried in my breasts and his hand tries to sneak under my shirt. I can hear him trying to smell my hair. I am instantly sick. I sent him a Facebook message the moment I'm back inside the school. This time, finally, I am not nice. I tell him, no more gifts, period, none. This is a matter of consent. I do not consent to any more gifts. You say you care about me, but you do not respect my wishes. No more gifts. After he responded, and I was confident that he actually understood my words, I blocked him. I changed my setting on my profile to make it harder to find. In November, a box arrived at the school, a subscription box that will be sent every month. There isn't a name who it's from, but I know who sent it. I went to speak with the police on campus, but guess what? Not much they can do since I don't have proof that it's from Bill. I have called the company, but they can't help because I'm not the account holder. The school is aware of the situation. They will hopefully remember him if he tries to see me at work again. The day before my birthday, he called my phone four times. On my birthday, he called my phone more than five times. I did not answer. Yesterday, the second package arrived at the school, with my name and the school address. I hope this story is over, but it might not be. I make sure I'm not followed when I leave work, but I don't have any clue what kind of car he drives. I have a special way I drive now, where everything is single lanes, hopefully making it easier to see if I'm followed.
I always check the caller ID before I answer my work phone. I'm afraid of anyone who expresses an interest in me now, because crushes are not cute anymore. I wait for more things to be delivered to the campus. I live in a constant state of panic, because what if he meant it? What if he has to be a part of my life, whether I like it or not? So, to Bill, the creepy cafeteria troll, let's not meet again. Update. It's been a year, and thankfully, I haven't heard a word. I don't get the feeling like I'm being watched anymore. I'm not scared every time my phone rings. I saw him at a grocery store, but I don't think he saw me. I simply don't shop at that store anymore. Place was expensive and far from home anyway. I've spoken to the police a few times. He called the last week of work before winter break, but thankfully, someone saw me crying at my desk and came over and picked up the phone the third time in a row he called. She said that the police had been contacted and he knew that he was not supposed to call. He asked to speak with me and she said that he was never going to speak to me again. He sounded shocked that someone else answered the phone and told him off. The police said that now I have a witness who also told him not to call, it will be easier to file a report. Now, if he calls back, they will file the report. I guess me saying it wasn't enough. I really wish the law would take this stuff seriously, but no one I have spoken to seems to see it as a real issue. One officer said that I had not made myself very clear and maybe speaking with him can clear up the issue. I've been home for two weeks, but tomorrow I go back to work. In high school, I had a stalker. I was 16 and we met on Facebook. He went to a school nearby and we decided to meet up for a movie. We had a great time together and ended up dating. First time he came to my parents' house, he had an ankle monitor on for house arrest and wouldn't tell anyone why. Red flag number one. And since he was a minor, we couldn't find out. My parents obviously didn't allow us to hang out, so we hung out at his house or around town at the YMCA camp. I was rebellious and naive. Things started to get weird when I noticed his family was pretty odd. One day we were in bed in his bedroom and I saw his father looking through the blinds. I screamed and called him out and his dad ran off. Stalker guy told me that his dad was just into redheads and liked to watch us. So this wasn't the first time. I went to leave and his mum was doing crack in the kitchen, so I decided it was time to break up. This is when it got bad. He started crying and told me that he's in cancer treatment and that's why he needs me. He doesn't have long to live, blah blah blah. I believed him and told him we could be friends. This is when the stalking started. He switched schools to my high school but never went to class. He would just stand outside of my classroom, looking inside until it was passing period. When I would leave class, he wouldn't address me. He would just follow about 10 to 15 feet behind me to my next period and stand outside the classroom again. I was too intimidated to say something to him. He was 6'4 and a heavy set guy, so I just let it happen for weeks. It started to progress where he would follow me home every day. He would get on the same bus as me despite living across town and walk 10 to 15 feet behind me all the way to my house. He would stand outside just staring up at the window until around the time my parents got home and then he would just leave. Finally, I told him to screw off and leave me alone. I told him we could no longer be friends or acquaintances and to forget about me. However, that escalated things way further. I started getting around 150 calls a night. Half of them were him screaming death threats and in detail torture methods that he wanted to do to me. And the other half were him singing me love songs that he wrote on his guitar. 
Every time I blocked his number, he seemed to just magically get a new one and leave more messages on that. I woke up one day to see that overnight, he had left me one of those dancing, singing snowmen on my porch. He had stabbed it in the head and the knife was still sticking out. He covered it in his liquid deodorant that I previously mentioned liking the smell of, and I noticed there was a hole where the little song recording device was. When I pressed the hand, it was not the regular Frosty the Snowman song that played. It was his voice singing eerily, I'm going to have you forever, I'm never going to let you be. I was done at this point and told my parents who contacted the school. They suspended him but he still waited at my bus stop every day and walked to my home with me. One day he ran at me like he was going to tackle me. When I tensed up for the impact, he stopped and hugged me. It wasn't a regular hug, it was like he was trying to crush me. I was 5'1 and about 90 pounds at the time and he ended up cracking one of my ribs. I cried and he started crying too before running off. He left me a voicemail apologizing in song. This one night is the night I'll never forget and it's the reason we got a restraining order and my dad got a gun. I woke up one evening for no reason, just was fully awake. I got up to go to my kitchen to get a glass of water to relax and in the reflection on my fridge, I saw movement in my backyard. I couldn't see well because it was so dark outside and so light inside. So I went to the back sliding glass doors to get a better look. When I got closer, I was met with a silhouette of a 6'4 man standing just outside the door. Stalker guy was in my backyard, under my room at 3 a.m., he was just staring at me. I yelled and my parents got up, but he was gone by the time my dad went outside. There's a patio right outside my bedroom window that goes all the way to the ground, so it's possible he could have been on top of the patio looking directly into my bedroom window before. We got a restraining order granted shortly after that and stalker guy dropped out of school. I haven't seen him since in person, but every six-ish months, he makes a new Facebook and tries to friend request me. I just block it and report it every time. Scary stuff. Y'all ever heard of that myth that if you wake up in the middle of the night for no reason, there's likely something looking at you? Well, maybe it's true. I don't know what he's doing now or where he went, but I don't care to know. Let's not meet ever again. I was stalked, but not because they were into me, because they were into my best friend, Emma. Emma is gorgeous, like to obscene level, and has always had guys and girls fawning over her. She had a friend named Mike. Mike is who this story is about. I met Mike through Emma, and it was clear immediately that Mike was obsessed with her. She was actually into him too for a bit, but she didn't want anything serious. Mike came on hard and heavy, so Emma distanced herself from him. She distanced herself even more after he made some shocking comments about his opinion on sexual assaults, mostly being fake. When Emma and I graduated high school, we had planned to move in together, but due to a family situation, she only stayed at our place about two days a week and never on a set schedule. She also could not keep a job to save her life. Her family was chaotic and made it where she would have to leave at a moment's notice. Emma also had several places she crashed at, family, friends, my family. It depended on her situation and any odd jobs she was working. She did a lot of odd jobs, babysitting, yard work, elder care, catering, etc. Nowhere stable, and often she wouldn't know what she was doing until that day. After Emma distanced herself from Mike, 
I started to realize he was at my work often, like three or so times a week. It would not have been too weird, except my work was a department store for women and children, no men's clothes at all at this store. At first, Mike would just come in, do a lap, and leave. It was weird, but I honestly just thought he was walking the mall. Lots of people do that, as my town has practically no entertainment. Then, Mike started hanging out in my store and talking to me while I worked, always talking about Emma. How's Emma? Why is she avoiding me? Those kinds of questions. I was evasive, giving one-word answers, trying to tell him I needed to work. My manager scolded me for having, quote, friends hanging while working. When I explained I did not want him there and that he wanted to know about my friend, my manager, who is awesome, asked if I wanted him to talk to Mike. I said yes, relieved. After that, Mike went back to doing a lap and leaving until my manager eventually stationed a big loss prevention guy at my register as a deterrent. It worked. No more Mike at work. I had won. Except I had not counted on Mike being extra creepy. He started showing up at my house. A couple of points. Mike did not have a car, and I lived in a different town than Mike, my family, and my job, about 20 minutes away by car. No public transport in my town or his. Uber did not exist in the area then either, and Mike did not have a job as far as I knew. Mike knew where I lived because when I first moved in, we had a housewarming party and accidentally made the Facebook invite public. Mike started coming over at random times, sometimes early in the morning, sometimes in the evening, always asking to speak to Emma. I always told him Emma wasn't there, even if she was. For her safety, I advised her to not come to the house anymore and to tell Mike she wasn't interested, which she did, bluntly, no more distancing, and blocked him. In this time, I moved in a new roommate, a co-worker who, while also female, had a gun and a big boyfriend. Mike started coming less frequently, and any time he did, I would tell him that he wasn't welcome. Now, I know I should have called the cops, but there were two things preventing me. One, I was from a not-so-grand family who avoided cops for the most part. Two, my new roommate was a criminal law major, and she was already concerned about how that would appear for her career. Not great reasons, but for a 19 to 20 year old, it was enough for me to not mention it. Eventually, I stopped seeing Mike, but I would still occasionally spot him places I was. The mall, my town's grocery store, my dog's favorite park. I stopped posting on Facebook around this time, because even though Mike was blocked, he was clearly still able to see my posts. I also got the creeping suspicion that he was coming by my house sometimes. The stuff on my porch would be moved. At night, my motion sensors would go off, and I kept finding Mike's cigarette butts. At least, it was the same kind he smoked. My roommate had been there for about four months, when one night, she had her boyfriend over. When someone started pounding on the door, when her boyfriend answered, he saw someone that looked like Mike running away. The next day, my roommate and her boyfriend went out of town for a concert. She gave me her gun, even though I felt safe because she had gotten a dog that she was training as a guard dog. I started watching a cooking show in the living room, and at some point, I fell asleep. In the middle of the night, I woke up to my dog and the guard dog losing their minds, barking like mad at the window. There was a tall figure that bolted as soon as I sat up. I grabbed the gun, opened the door and yelled, I know it's you. I have a gun and I'm calling the cops, which I didn't do. I just locked me and the dogs in the bathroom and called my dad, who luckily was not angry about being woken up in the middle of the night. He drove over and advised calling the cops and filing a restraining order. We did call the cops, but they said since nothing was broken and there was no evidence, there was nothing to be done about it. Luckily, after this, 
I heard through the grapevine that about a week after the incident with my dogs, Mike's family sent him to live with a relative in a different state. He did come back a couple of years ago, but he was wise enough to only contact me once, when I got to tell him that Emma was not only happily married, but not at all interested in talking to him. I reminded him that I was willing to call the cops if he ever came near either of us again. He never did, and I don't see him anymore, though he did try to friend my husband on Facebook. All it took was another block for him to go away. So, it's been about five years since I last saw you, Mike. Let's not meet. So, for a little background here, I've played the drums for 11 years of my life, so I've gotten pretty decent at marching percussion and playing the drum set. I'm currently a college student who obviously needs money, so I took up two jobs that had to do with teaching drumming to kids. The first job, which I only recently left because of the pandemic, was an amazing opportunity at a school district to be a part-time music teacher. I loved that job. This story has to do with the other music job I took up, which was at a non-profit that I don't want to name for legal reasons that resides in my town. So, at this non-profit, there are two main coordinators in charge who happen to be an older married couple. The husband was in charge of the science and art side of the facility, while the wife, Bernice, was in charge of the music side of the facility. So she was in all aspects my boss, and also one of the piano teachers. I taught drum set with a high school friend of mine named Jay. There was a guitar teacher, who I was also friends with, named Ray, and an elderly piano teacher named Marie. So that was the entire music department at the facility. I started the job when their last drum set teacher suddenly left to pursue his dream career in the Bay Area. Bernice really needed me to start immediately, so I did, but during my interview, she had been very nice and cordial but I sometimes noticed how rude she was to other employees. Most of the people working on the science side were merely high school students, and one of them may forget a small thing, like forgetting to put a screwdriver back where it belonged, and she would degrade them. She would say things like, how will you keep a job if you can't do simple things like this? Are you ever going to use your brain? I should fire you for this kind of incompetency but I won't because I'm a nice person. I would see this kind of stuff go down and I could never say anything because honestly, I really didn't think it was my business and I didn't want to get yelled at either. I will also briefly explain that she also revealed that she was very religious and homophobic and I was very obviously not straight. I tried to ignore these outbursts, but they started to get to me I would try to talk to those kids afterwards and reassure them that they could only do their best, and that should be good enough. A few months into the job, I even tried to talk to her about it, but that was a huge mistake. I said that maybe she shouldn't be so hard on them since they are all just kids. She had been cheerful and smiling, but once I finished that sentence, she got quiet. Her expression went blank and her eyes turned cold. If looks could kill, I'm sure I would be very dead. After a few seconds of silence, she suddenly yelled, Mind your own business. Those ungrateful brats need to learn their place, and so do you. I was absolutely stunned. I had no words. I had never been yelled at like that by a boss in any of my jobs before, so it really just shook me. I just sat there with what I'm guessing was a look of shock. She then immediately went back to smiling and simply said, I think you have a lesson with little Timmy in five minutes, don't you? Better get ready for it. And she said it with a smile on her face, like what the hell? I just got up and got ready for my next lesson. After that, I began to get yelled at by her pretty much every week for the smallest thing. 
maybe if I finished a lesson a minute early, or I forgot to fill in my timesheet right away. I endured months of this, until finally I had enough. I lasted a year and a half until I finally quit. When I quit, she encouraged me to call or text any time, which seemed so odd considering she had yelled at me every day for the last week I worked. I thanked her for the opportunity she gave me and left without incident. Or at least I thought it was without incident. Before I left my position, I recommended to a parent to have their kid get lessons from a friend of mine because her son was an absolute musical prodigy who needed more intense training to grow as a musician. She thanked me and I connected them and he is actually still getting lessons with my friend and I get the occasional video of his progress and I am just so proud of him. Only 10 and he can outplay me easily on a drum set. However, the mother of the student accidentally told Bernice the reason why her son was leaving the non-profit and said that I had recommended it. That happened in the middle of January 2020. By the end of January, my email inbox had been flooded with emails from Bernice. They ranged from her needing me to come back to sign a form to obviously being mad about recommending the student leave the non-profit. Every day, there were at least 10 emails and on bad days, there were upwards of 30 emails. I blocked her email after two weeks because I knew it just wasn't going to stop and I finally had some relief. Then I noticed she tried to friend me on Facebook and follow me on Instagram. When I blocked those accounts, it was her husband's accounts that tried. I then blocked those as well. She tried it again and used the non-profit social media pages to follow me. I had no idea why she was being so persistent and didn't know what to do. It seemed to calm down, so I thought she gave up, but a week later, I had random accounts try to follow me on all my social media. I asked my friends that I had worked with if they could see her doing this while she was in the office. So Jay and Ray went into the office when she had a lesson and looked on her monitor, and there were a bunch of tabs open. They sent me a snap of what they found and all these tabs were different faceless accounts on Facebook and Instagram that had been attempting to follow me. They closed them all out, and when she asked about it, they feigned ignorance and said they had been looking for sheet music and the tabs had accidentally been closed. They said she looked super pissed, but then suddenly asked them if they had me on social media, and they just said they didn't know and tried to walk out. Before they walked out, she asked them if they would tell her what lies I had told them, and they said they didn't know what she was talking about. She got even more pissed and yelled at them to stop acting stupid and to tell the truth, and they again told her that I never said anything about her or the non-profit. She suddenly went on a whole tangent about how I was going to steal all the students, and the non-profit would have to shut down. From here... She never spoke to them again about it, but after this, I did notice I started seeing her whenever I went to Walmart in town to get groceries and such. I'm telling you, 8 out of 10 times that I would go, she would be there. She never spoke a word to me, but she always just kind of lurked. One day, my younger sister said that Bernice spoke to her while she was at the McDonald's inside the Walmart when she went after school to grab food with friends. Luckily, my sister knew who she was, so she knew not to give any information to her when she asked if she was my sister and how I was doing. My sister kindly said she didn't know who she was and didn't feel comfortable talking to her and then proceeded to ignore her. Bernice just smiled and then left, but my sister called me shortly afterwards and asked to be picked up from Walmart because she rightfully felt super uncomfortable. I sped over from my college and got there within 15 minutes and she ran out and got into my car and we sped off. As I left the parking lot, I could see Bernice's car had pulled out of a space and was following us. 
I knew it was her because I had seen it every time I went to work and it had a logo for the non-profit on the side of it so it was hard to miss. I realized she had been waiting in that space to either follow my sister back to school or in this case to follow me who had picked her up. I drive a bright red Honda Civic so it's pretty easy to see even from a distance so I knew I had to lose this crazy lady because I had no idea what her intentions were. So I decided to take some side street and drive all kinds of random ways through our town. And then I even got onto the highway that takes you to the closest major city and then got off a random country road. It was insane because this woman was persistent as hell. She caught up and kept up with me until I got onto the highway. Once I got on, I easily was doing 80 to 90 miles an hour and weaving in and out of traffic to lose her and eventually I did. I then parked in between some orchards off one of the country roads I took. My sister had been on the phone with our mum the entire time who had then proceeded to let our town police know. We got on the phone with them and they told us to drive to the police station and there would be someone waiting to help us. So I made my way back to town while constantly checking my mirrors for Bernice. We made it and I gave a statement and they made a report and then asked me to describe the car. I said it was a burgundy SUV with the non-profit's logo on the side. They said it should be easy to find and they went straight to the non-profit to find her. Sadly, Bernice had an alibi waiting for them when they got there. She showed them the security footage of the front of the facility and the burgundy SUV with the logo had been sitting in its spot since opened so there was no way she could have followed me according to the police. They say there was nothing more they could do and it was left at that but I knew what I had seen. It was messing with my mind for days until finally I got my answer on how she pulled off that stunt. Jay informed me two weeks later that Bernice had announced that they had bought an identical SUV with the logo and everything for the non-profit. I was stunned. It was the same make, model, and color as the other SUV. Even the license plates were almost identical, only having two digits differ from the original SUV's plate. Bernice had played the cops into thinking I just had an overactive imagination. She knew exactly what she was doing. I was just so frustrated by this point. Eventually, I emailed her and told her to stay away from my family and me because I was never going to be talking to her again and clarified that I had no intention of taking any students from her. Hell, I'm not even a goddamn music major so why would I even want to continue doing anything music-oriented? Her reply was almost instantaneous. Sounds good, dear. You take care now. And be sure to tell your sister I said hi. Bernice, I really hope we never meet again. I'm a female, 5'3", 115 pounds, so I guess I'm pretty small. That's my reasoning for being very submissive over all of this. When I started working at this fast food chain, I was 16. It was my first job, and I was excited to finally take my first steps into adulthood. This co-worker of mine was training me. For privacy reasons, I'm going to call him Frank. Frank, at first glance, looks young, 19, 21 at most. We got along and nothing wasn't too bad, nor alarming. Like conversations about anime and such. I remember things started to change slightly when he was talking about a video game character and none of our co-workers knew who it was. When I saw the green hat character, I said, Oh, that's Link. How cute. I used to watch my brother play Legend of Zelda Four Swords. He looked at me and said, Marry me. I laughed it off and continued on with my day. 
For the rest of my shift, he would hover over me, asking me personal questions like my age, favorite things, etc. Being the open, friendly person I was, I answered happily. I told him how I loved butterflies and that I was 16. I'm 17 now and have had several jobs since. When an older man asks you for your age as a minor, it's never a good sign. Moving on to December, I've been at this chain for a month now. My manager asked me if I wanted to come to their company secret Santa party and I agreed. When the day came, I arrived with my now ex-best friend. Frank arrives on the phone acting busy and such, but I thought nothing of it. During the whole party, he was on the phone. I was getting food when he tapped my shoulder, still on the phone, and handed me a beautiful butterfly necklace. I didn't know what to say besides thanking him, thinking he was my secret Santa. Then later, my other co-worker comes up to me, handing me a gift card to Starbucks and a plush. I ask why, and she said she was my secret Santa. I thought it must have been a mistake, and went on with my night listening to my old best friend tell me how I should date Frank, which in my mind was never on the table. January rolls around, and it was Frank's birthday. We were just working until I heard one of my female co-workers, who was into him at the time, wish him a happy birthday. Being that person, I wish him happy birthday while my other co-worker asks how old he's turning. He said 27. Might I add that every shift I worked with him, he would take several photos of me before and after my shift, commenting about my hair, my skin, my eyes, often said how cute my nose was. Again, not wanting to cause a scene, I just laugh everything off. That's always the case, isn't it? We don't want to cause a scene. I did start telling him to please stop, but of course he wouldn't, no matter how many times I asked him to. Now I'm going to skip to May, my birthday month, and of course, I was working on my birthday. I went to the back door as usual. Due to COVID, I had to ring a doorbell and wait for someone to open the door. Out of nowhere, Frank pops out of the bushes, handing me all kinds of gifts. Today was his day off too, so I was generally confused. I remember thinking, how the hell did he know my birthday? I never talk about it, since I don't like celebrating it. He followed me around for a few minutes before awkwardly leaving when I apologize that I want to get to work and not get yelled at. In July is when I finally found a new job. I quit due to sexual harassment I had to endure for the nine months I worked there from my shift lead. That's a whole other story. But when a man starts getting a handsy, don't laugh it off. You gotta shut that down. It got really bad when that ex-best friend that I mentioned earlier started showing all my co-workers, including Frank, and the shift lead explicit photos of me that she stole off my phone without me knowing. I was very insecure at the time and was in an abusive relationship, so I would give anything this boy asked of me. Anyway, at that point, I had about had it. After being interrogated about the shift lead, I put in my two weeks. On my last week, everyone was talking about how that shift lead got laid off for sexual harassment. Frank and I were doing dishes and the topic came up. I awkwardly told him about it, now knowing how everyone knew my story. The shift lead would often grab my ass, rub my thigh, talk about my boobs, about how if they were bigger, things he would do to my body, etc. I would say stop politely, but he would continue. When I started yelling and saying stop more assertively, he would often make me do humiliating tasks like clean the greasy floors on my hands and knees or cleaning the dining room when it was closed due to COVID. When I told Frank this, he shrugged it off and said that there was no reason for him to be fired. I remember being absolutely shocked, retorting, I'm just glad I'm leaving this hellhole and left it at that. A month into my new job as a hostess, everything was going well. It's a restaurant, but everyone just comes there to drink, so it's more of a bar. 
On one of my 2am shifts, Frank stops by on his bike. I tried to be friendly, but was getting frustrated when he kept cutting me off and talking to other people. I then walk away to bus tables because no one else would do it and he couldn't follow me into the restaurant, outdoor seating of course. After bussing all the tables, I come up to the counter to see my co-workers giggling. What's happening? I asked. The other hostess smiled. That's so cute how your boyfriend takes photos of you while you're working. It's so cute how obsessive he is over you. He wouldn't stop talking about you to us. Boyfriend? I was and still happily remain single after that bullcrap of a relationship. The only person they could be referring to was Frank. Then it dawned on me, how the hell did he know where I was working and my shift schedule? I didn't tell anyone besides my parents and my brother. A week goes by and Frank comes back. I may have gotten a little over dramatic, but I didn't know what else to do. I told the other host at the counter to tell him I'm not working today and dashed inside. I told my manager that this man, Frank, keeps taking photos of me as I'm working and it's making me uncomfortable. My manager told me to stay in the back room while he went and handled the situation. Our restaurant is very popular in the area, so it's very crowded in the front. Frank with his bike was blocking customers and that's what my manager was telling him. My idiotic ass was popping my head up from under the counter from the back room window where I could see what was going on in the front. I freak out a little when I see Frank get aggressive with my manager. He begins thrashing when my manager tries to lead him out of the front. Suddenly, Frank throws his bike and tries heading into the building. A few male waiters see what's happening and were informed by my manager. I remember one waiter standing in the back room with me, watching the door as another was practically fighting with Frank. I could only hear yelling outside the door. And then it went quiet. I spent the rest of the shift like that, cleaning silverware with the mail server. From then on, people would walk me to my car, even if it was broad daylight. From August to November, he would be on his bike passing by the restaurant from a distance. He would just be watching and taking photos for 10 to 20 minutes before leaving. Now, the reason I thought of putting this here was now it's been a little more intense besides just the looking from a distance. Due to COVID, I'm not needed anymore because my restaurant is takeout only. I've been working seasonal jobs while working at the restaurant, but now I'm not working and waiting to get my schedule. Because I was bored this day, I drive to my local mall just to do a little more Christmas shopping. While driving, I look in my rearview mirror to see a recognizable face. It was Frank. I practically choke seeing his face in my mirror. I try not to get the best of myself and knock it off as a coincidence. Yeah, it wasn't. He followed me throughout the mall, then later followed me as I was driving home. No one knows where I live besides that old friend and I'd like to keep it that way. So I drove for an hour, getting lost and taking every random turn I could until I lost him. I now believe this is how he would track me down. My car isn't common, but it doesn't stand out too much. I've rarely left my house since. It's January 2021, and ever since the start of this new year, I've been getting phone calls like this. Hello? The caller breathes into the phone like a creep. Again, I say hello, and then the caller ends the call. Along with that, I've gotten many random messages asking about gifts and delivering me a gift. I'm not one who usually uses social media, but these messages were all over mine. All of them were from newly made accounts across Snapchat and Instagram. On one occasion, an account started sending me photos, photos that I never sent to anyone. These were photos of my cat and me that I had saved in my Snapchat album. Just photo after photo of things that I've never sent anyone, ending with, I have a gift for you. I deleted both apps along with deleting almost everything off my phone. 
A week ago, I downloaded Snapchat again due to some dumb assignment my teacher wanted us to do with that crap social media app. One of my old co-workers sent me a message. I opened it. It said, Frank wants to give you your Christmas gift. Want to stop by? Maybe I'm just overreacting, or maybe those accounts were Frank. I just want to say, my personality has changed because of all of this. I'm very protective now. Rarely talk to anyone. Not as friendly as I was back then. It's only been a little over a year, yet I feel like I've aged 10 plus. I just want to say, Frank, let's not meet and screw your Christmas gift. Let me start out. I'm a very nice person and I'll befriend most people if they're nice and our personalities go well together. Here's where Chris comes in. At my first job, I met Chris. He was nice, but I was in no way attracted to him. Yet I continued to be his friend and made it pretty clear I'd only be friends with him. I eventually stopped hanging out with him and started ignoring him, but sometimes I fear he'll show up at my job again. I noticed very early on that he was very clingy and would rush to hang out. It was always almost immediately after asking if we could hang out, he'd want to stop by. Still, I pushed it aside and said, well, maybe he has no friends. However, he held grudges very strongly. Once, this girl who also worked with us didn't say hi back to him, and he said, screw that bitch, she can die. He wishes bad to anyone who's rude to him, another red flag to run. But yet, I continued to be nice. Summer had ended, and I was going back to college. Even though I was about an hour away, he still wanted to hang out. He was willing to drive all the way here just to hang out. I found it kind of annoying that he just wouldn't make more friends and tried to push it off. Once, he even texted me saying he'd shoot himself, so I called him and tried to comfort him that things would get better. During college, I had Tinder and finally found someone who I liked and we started dating. That's when he got even more clingy and weird. Chris was always depressed and talking about no one wants him and that 21 was a good age to die. At that point, I was severely annoyed at him because he was trying to guilt me into dating him. When we hung out, he'd ask, why not me? What's wrong with me? Every time I'd choose to hang out with my boyfriend, he'd text things like, you'll never hear from me again, I'll be dead. I ignored them because there was something not right with that guy. Summer came around again. I was still working at the same company, but at a different location. I was still kind of friends with him, though I avoided hanging out with him while I was at college. He worked at the same company, but at the previous location. He wanted to transfer to my location because, quote, he hated the people there, and I'd be working at the new location. Some point during the summer, I started to ignore him, because he was even more annoying and trying to guilt me into dating him. My boyfriend clearly didn't like him because he thinks he's crazy and did not want me near him. An example being, during the summer, he started talking about buying skips, which he clarified to mean a gun after I asked because he wanted to tag along with my boyfriend. And I said, I want some alone time and you'd be a third wheel. This is where things get weird. After the fallout and weeks of not texting, he came into my line at the store to buy one single item and said not a word. May I point out that there were seven other lines open and he works at the same company but at the other location. While working, every now and again, I'd look around to see him walking out near the cashier line. Every time I saw him, I was in the corner register, so thankfully he didn't or couldn't see me. I saw him there on three different occasions. I often think about if he's been in the store more than I have seen him. 
college started again and I went to live on campus. I would get text messages from him every now and again saying hi, hey, or hey, how are you? Then he started messaging me on Snapchat to say, let's talk about this like adults. I finally replied because at this point, he wouldn't leave me alone. I told him I had no interest in being his friend because he was toxic and needed to make new friends. He finally gave up. However, winter break has come and I have to decide if I want to work during the break or not. He often talked about getting his gun license. My one fear is that he'll show up when I'm at work. However, I don't feel safe at home either. He lives about five minutes away from me. That was another red flag that sprung into my head during our friendship. He moved there when he moved out of his parents. I just found it eerily creepy that he chose the town I was in and minutes away. I have a feeling he'll be lurking through the store. When I go home, all I think about is him sitting in his car in the street next to my house. He never bought me any gifts, but he frequently asked if he could buy me a teddy bear. He even made me an account on a streaming site. Sometimes I think I may be overreacting. I guess all I can say is, wish me luck and hope he finds someone else to obsess over. Update. Five days after I said no, I don't want to be friends. He just messaged me again. I think it's time for the cops. This time, it said something along the lines of, we really need to talk about being friends. Answer when you're ready. He's so clingy. A couple of days later, he tried to bait me into talking to him by wishing me a Merry Christmas. So, uh, maybe, let's not meet again. I was stalked via hacking. June. My partner Johnny comes upstairs and finds it cute how I'm checking him out on OkCupid. I'm confused as I haven't logged in lately, like in months. How could I have been looking at his account? I log in and check it out. There's a list of seven or so people that have been checked out from my account today, Johnny's included, and also someone I work with. Well, that's embarrassing. Nope, wasn't me. Time to change my password. The next day at work, I was sure to bring it up and laugh about the fact that my OkCupid account was hacked to the person who was in my viewed list. I didn't want this person thinking I actually looked at his account. We work too closely together and I already get the impression he may see me as more than his boss. It always pleased him that his luggage tags printed his middle name and first name as Chris T., this is not the type of person who should see his name written out like he's God's gift to earth. I'll refer to him as Chris. Chris laughed off the OkCupid okay hacking comment I made. I found it strange he had no questions or comments on the subject, but most people would at least ask if you changed your password, but nothing from Chris. I brushed off the situation. A few days later, I was out of the office for work. Johnny messaged me saying it was happening again, that I checked him out on OkCupid. No, I didn't, but I changed my password again. July. This weekend I'm having a lazy morning in bed with Johnny. I get a Facebook notification. Your account has been logged in from a new location. The IP address points to Chris's hometown. My heart's racing. What the hell is going on? I take care of the Facebook password and screenshot the notification. Later that night, I get a text from Chris. Happy fourth boss, lol. I assume he's drunk and worried about being caught having his access to my Facebook revoked so quickly. No, it can't be him doing this. It's just coincidence, right? Johnny is convinced it's Chris but that means someone I work with on a very small team is targeting me. This will make work nearly impossible. I can't talk to anyone at work about this. I'll have no way to run my department. The situation will get minimized. 
Chris drank a lot. I'd see it at work events or when we traveled, just the two of us. He often got out of hand, but everyone brushed it off. He's young, it was funny, we've all had those nights. But as long as you show up to work the next day, it's fine, they would say. I brought it up to him once. Hey Chris, you need to be more cautious about how much you drink at work events. He didn't speak to me for three days. I offended him, told him that he's not allowed to have fun at work events, he told me, when he finally snapped at me. He recoiled. He's three times my size and we're in a secluded space at work. One time while traveling with just the two of us, I got very sick. I told him I couldn't make it out for dinner, so Chris offered to pick something up from a nearby store. He knocked on my room door and handed me the water he had gotten me. He tried to make small talk as I thanked him and indicated I was going to lay down. It was apparent by his stance in my hotel room doorway he wanted to come in. He moved an inch closer and I said goodnight, shut my door and locked every lock I could. It wasn't the only time he made me feel uncomfortable. I hadn't noticed any other accounts being hacked for a while. I was cautious around Chris, even disassociated when I could. I avoided work outings if he was going, would back out of lunch plans that he decided to go on once he knew I was going, but we often had to work very closely. We were a team after all. I couldn't do my job without him, and him without me. November. Johnny was online checking out his FedLife account one evening. He saw I was also online via the old messenger they used to have. Johnny asks me if I'm logged in. I'm not. Again, my heart's racing. It's different this time though. The violations are beginning to feel commonplace, normal, expected. But this hacking is extreme. No one outside my FedLife friends knows about this account. Definitely no one I work with and there's some faceless nude photos of me there. I reached out to FetLife. They gave me the IP address of the last login. It's the same as the Facebook hack. Crap. I can't avoid this anymore. I can't pretend it's just a coincidence anymore, but I need proof it's Chris. All I have is an IP address and intuition. I can't take that to HR. The police maybe? Will they help or make matters worse if they need to contact my employer? I start looking into the login history of any accounts that tracks it. My bank account. Why is there an iPhone logging into it daily? I don't have an iPhone, but Chris does. Crap. This is real. This is happening. I don't know what to do. I'll call the bank while at work and ask them about the unknown login. Chris is at his desk right next to me. The conversation is easily overheard. I hang up with the bank. They can't help. Chris didn't say a thing. Under normal conditions, a co-worker would inquire, Wow, is everything okay? Did you change your password? Did any money go missing? Nothing from him though. So out of character. He's always interested in my personal life. The next weekend, I wake up to a phone call. The caller is calling from my phone number. My heart skips a beat, but I answer. No one responds. I just hear breathing. That's it. I've had it. I'm losing my sanity. I spent weeks, months, researching IP addresses and how I might be able to use the only info I have. I've lost sleep. I can't focus at work. Johnny is worried about me and my safety. I am too. But what can I do? Johnny suggests that we go to the police. I don't want to, but I'm at a dead end. I agree. The officer is kinder and more receptive to my situation than I expected. This serves as a reminder to me that this is a big deal. I shouldn't minimize it in my own thoughts. She takes the report, every detail. They will use the IP to subpoena the internet service provider. Weeks go by. The officer on my case claims there's no crime. The ISP records were never obtained. December. My work email keeps doing this strange thing. 
messages I've read being marked as unread. Weird. Is it him, or just the multiple devices I use to check it on? I don't know, I can't tell. The server doesn't keep a log in history that I can see. Should I talk to IT? I know them well. They will help, but that would make the situation real and known at work. No, not yet. I can't bring myself to do it. I can't do this anymore. My heart is constantly racing. The slightest noise sends me into panic. I get a security camera for my front door and worry a bit less when I hear the door slam from the wind or when the dogs bark at something they hear. I'm becoming comfortable living in fear as much as it's impacting my health. At least I have the pepper spray Johnny got me. I carry it whenever I'm outside. Chris and I have a shared account we use for work. Maybe I can get an IP address from that. If it matches, that's some proof, right? Dead ends. What if I sent him an IP tracker? I've learned you can place an invisible pixel in an email. It will send you the IP address of where it was read. All I have of Chris's is his work email and a Gmail. I tested both, on myself first of course. I can't take the risk of him figuring out I'm onto him. Damn it, our work email blocks it, and Gmail reroutes to their HQ, another dead end. More hours, days, weeks pass. I call private investigators. They're impressed I've tried the tactics they already have at their disposal. I feel confident that I'm doing all I can, but more lost that professionals can't help. February. One last attempt. It's a week before I have a seven day out of country trip with Chris. It's with a large group this time, but I'll still be working very close, too close with him. I send Chris an email with a shortened link that will track what IP address it was clicked on from. I've tested this, it seems to work, but I'm shaking. What if this tips him off? What if he knows I'm onto him and he attacks me at work? What do I send him to get him to click? I find a local event that this particular breed of neckbeard would be interested in. I say, hey Chris, saw this and thought you'd be interested. Five minutes later, Chris replies, pure panic. No, excitement maybe. A mix of both sets in. I don't care what the reply says. I check the IP tracker. It got a hit. I'm shaking. I can barely type or hold my phone. It's the same IP address as the Facebook and FetLife hack. I got it. I have the proof I need. It's Chris who's been stalking me via my accounts. My intuition was right. As much as I didn't want it to be confirmed as him, it is. There's relief. A weight has been removed. But then it sets back in. What do I do now? Go to HR? Back to the police? We've got that trip coming up. I need my team doing their job. I'll wait till after I'm back. It's not that bad. I'm used to living like this now. Johnny thinks I'm insane for considering it. He's right, I am. I've lost touch with reality. This situation has enabled me to determine what levels of uncomfortable one can and should live with. A night of debate and I've made my decision. I won't wait, I'll do it now. I text my boss, Jay, the next day, asking him to meet me for lunch on Sunday. I need to talk to you, away from the office. This is not a normal request. We're close at work, but this is bizarre to him. He tells me I'm scaring him. I wish I could tell him, don't worry. The following day we meet for lunch. I'm so nervous I could vomit. This is it. This makes this all real now. I tell him everything. I'm worried he may minimize the issue and say something like, Chris is just a kid. He didn't mean anything. I'll talk to him tomorrow. After I finish speaking, Jay is at a loss for words. We have a plan in place to take this to HR tomorrow, and he's already helping me find someone to replace Chris on our work trip. Again, I'm relieved and nervous at the same time. It's gonna go down tomorrow. 
seven months of living in fear, and finally, I can see an end. Monday. My pepper spray is in my pocket. I picked out a work outfit that would conceal it today. Jay calls me, asks me a question. I don't remember what, but I take it as an invite to go to his office. Anything to get away from the person I now know, without a doubt, has been hacking and stalking me. Jay wasn't expecting me, but understood. The department head is in his office. Jay is about to inform him of my situation. Having my story told by a third party was surreal. I filled in the details where needed and gave them the folder of the evidence I had collected to take to HR, screenshots, IP address, written accounts of the timeline up to this point, the email from Chris confirming his involvement, and the info from the IP tracker. The day is a haze. I was at HR's office at least twice, saw the police drive through the campus, and had to fight my way to the HR director. He didn't feel I had enough evidence to prove the email I sent to Chris's Gmail was actually the Chris that worked here. I dug through my work email. Bam. He emailed my work email from his Gmail account once. Enough evidence for our non-believer. Hours go by. It's almost 3pm. What the hell is going on? If I keep leaving my desk, Chris will know something's up. I can't call HR and ask. He'll hear the conversation. Chris walks over to me. Oh crap, he says. He's shoving his work phone in my face. Too close for comfort. He's got an invite to go to HR for 4pm. I'm screaming inside. No one else is around. If he's going to do something to me, now is the time. That notice is the forewarning of being fired. That's how they do it at my job. I manage to look concerned and tell him, I'll let you know if I get one, insinuating maybe our team is being let go, not just you. He walks away, no idea where to. I sit at my desk, shaking in fear. I don't know when he will return. How could HR betray me like this? They know the situation. Damn it, they should have warned me they were about to send it. I could have fled. I could have gone somewhere safe. Mike stops by my desk just to say hi and offer me some leftover catering. I can't eat right now, but in this moment, Mike has offered me so much more than the leftovers. He has no idea what's going on, but can see in my face something is wrong. I ask to walk back to his office with him. Chris will never find me there. An hour or forever passes by. It's got to be done by now. I know Chris will be escorted back to gather his things. I do not want to be there for that. I sneak to Jay's office. He checks the area for me. Chris is gone. Jay heard from HR. As per HR, I'm not allowed to speak to anyone as to why Chris was fired. What the hell? Are they serious? This leaves me so vulnerable. If Chris decides to come back to work, no one would stop him. In fact, they would welcome him with open arms. If I'm left looking like the bitch that fired the nice, quiet kid. That week. The IT department took a few extra days to gather Chris's devices. I had time to look through them during that period. The days before our trip was one of much discovery. Not just what I found on his computer, but what I learned from the people around me. The day after he was fired, I looked into his laptop. IT had no issues getting me into his files. I was Chris's boss and I needed his work. His pictures folder, a lot of personal stuff, stupid memes, vacation pictures, screenshots of naked cam girls he chatted with, and me. Some pictures I had never seen before, some I had. The pictures I was familiar with were from a cruise I went on months earlier with Johnny. Only these were the ones I deleted. I had a GoPro set to take pictures every 10 seconds that hung around my wrist. While walking around, I inadvertently took close-ups of my ass in a swimsuit. Upon importing my vacation pictures, I deleted those from my computer. Were they still on the card? Then there were some pictures from my Google account. 
Well, it was a picture of a picture on the screen. He got into my Google account too? Why didn't I catch that one? Then, the ones I had never seen. Pictures that had been taken around the office and on work trips. Me and my desk. Me bent over setting up gear. A close-up of a hint of cleavage shot from above. His phone was more of the same. A close-up of my ass while he sat behind me. Me struggling with an AV rack in a closet while in a dress. Video from under a table during a meeting while I'm wearing a skirt. Zoomed in up the skirt photos. Pictures of dates I had written on a post. Pictures of my phone settings showing my FetLife account. The nausea sets in again. I remember all these moments in the pictures he had taken of me. Him nonchalantly on his phone, looking like he's slacking off or answering an email. Little did I know, he was filling his spank bank with pictures of me during work hours and keeping a record of my days off. What a creep. I got to his browser history. It was sickening. He researched how to hack someone's text messages. He stalked friends of mine on Facebook, as well as my partner. He got into my Amazon, Gmail, Facebook, FetLife, work email, OkCupid, and bank account. He read old emails of past relationships, looked at the places I visit, and stalked images from events I go to. There was hard evidence now. I took it to the local police near work. They couldn't handle it, so I went to the county prosecutor office. Most people wouldn't think of that. It was suggested by Johnny's friends. They had a computer forensics department and could handle the case. I met with an amazing detective. He took my packet of evidence and listened to the whole story. It's becoming easier to tell the story, especially when it's to focus on the facts. At my office, I learned more about Chris, how he slandered me to my co-workers. I knew I couldn't tell people I worked with why Chris was fired, but for my safety, I knew I had to tell a few people, just the ones close to me. Once they knew the story, I heard things from them like, Chris would complain I didn't pay him enough. He lied and said he made half of what he actually did to co-workers. I even fought to get him above normal raises for two years. He lied and said I would withhold work from him. They usually responded by telling him to talk to my bosses or HR. Obviously, he never did. You can't take lies to HR and directors. He spread lies around the office, coercing co-workers to take his side when I wasn't aware there were sides to be had. From these people, I learned more about the obsession Chris had with me. He craved to have power over me. He showed them my FetLife profile. He bragged about how compatible we are on OkCupid. He even spoke about being obsessed with my partner. He told them how he tried to catfish me on Reddit. I couldn't blame them though. Chris laid the groundwork and a bit of gaslighting on them. To them, I was a bad person and Chris was their friend. Chris was really good at playing the victim and never was able to take any self-responsibility. Nine months went by. I followed up with the detectives often. It took a while to subpoena his devices from the company, then run forensics. In early September, I got a call from the detective. They arrested Chris. They showed up early morning at his home where he still lived with his parents and admitted to everything. He took the card from the GoPro and recovered the images. He got my passwords once I walked away from my computer. He went through my phone when it was left at my desk. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall. The shock to his family of the type of person he actually is, him cowering while in handcuffs, face to face with what he had done. No hiding behind a computer screen anymore. I was on vacation when this happened. I remember thinking, it's not long now till everyone at work will know. He's got a court date set. By then, it's public record. I can't help if people know after that point. I don't have to wait that long though. Later that day, co-workers started sending me a link. Hey, did you work with this guy? What a creep. The link was to the county prosecutor's PR page, announcing Chris's arrest, mugshot and all. 
I came back to work and was able to have the truth come out. It was liberating. It took another nine months for his final court date. I worked with prosecutors during that time to determine how I wanted to proceed. I opted for a probation period instead of going through a trial and fighting for jail time. While Chris deserves the jail time, he wasn't worth my time nor effort, and a trial would offer him a slim chance of getting off scot-free. Also, this way, he would get some much-needed counseling. Three years, no contact with me. Three years sexual offense counseling. Three years of checking in with a probation officer. This way, I can at least hope he will come out understanding that what he did was unacceptable and, fingers crossed, he will never do it to another living being again. I knew there was no chance of rehab in jail. The hearing. Of course I was nervous. I didn't want to see Chris, but I knew whatever I was feeling, he was feeling a thousand times worse. I didn't have to go, but I knew I would regret it if I didn't. With my fiance Johnny at my side, I watched as he got up in front of the judge after he cried in the courtroom and agreed to the terms of his sentence. His mum glared at me the whole time as though this was all my fault. So that's where he gets it from.